When we're talking about mycotoxins, what I mostly wanted you guys to know is that we could be dealing with a infection, we could be treating a patient for Lyme, we could be dealing with a patient with neurodegenerative symptoms, and we may not be thinking about mold or mycotoxins. And that's, that's the goal of this lecture, to try to keep in our radar the fact that maybe mold could be causing these issues. How does mold enter our bodies? Well, the, there are a few ways. By the skin is one. You can get it through the pores. You can even get it through in inhalation. And in the edmoid and sinuses, it can stay, and it can actually even cross through the orbital area. And it can even get across to the base of the skull in the basal, I'm sorry, in the um, lamina criba where if there is permeability, it can even in, get inside the central nervous system. So this is how important mold can be. And uh, in other uh, cases, it can also enter through the mouth, although usually not a, a, a major source of disruption. And as I mentioned, under normal circumstances, we have mold located everywhere, outdoors and indoors. And it's going to be affected by the pathogens or competitive um, living organisms surrounding that mold. If it's in the outdoors, it can coexist without up, up to a hundred different types of fungus. But if it's in the indoors and there's just moist because that's all there uh, is, all that it is needed, moist or water, then that mold will in fact reproduce and create mycotoxins. Inside the body, if we have mold, then we can also produce mycotoxins. And when we're exposed to treatment, if you're receiving antifungals, then you can also have that mold create even more mycotoxins. The individual is going to be affected by the type of mycotoxin that it, he is exposed, of, exposed to. So there are different types, there are different groups. Uh, the, the groups that we usually study are the aflatoxins, like I mentioned, the ochratoxins, the trichotoxins, and the gliotoxins. Each of these are gonna cause different symptoms. As we know we can clear these toxins, but when there is HL HLA-DR gene present, then our uh, pathogen recognition receptors, which are going to be uh, needed for the identification of the antibodies to target these toxins, will not be so much present. And then this is how we develop then what we know as chronic inflammatory response syndrome. Now, it's important to mention that you can also develop chronic infl inflammatory response syndrome by uh, also a continuous re-exposure without having this HLA uh, predisposition. So we can have three, three basic scenarios in this, uh, in this example. You can either have the mold exposure, you can have mycotoxins only, or you can have both. So you may have to use antifungals, or you may not have to use antifungals depending on the case, and sometimes the use of antifungals may be detrimental to the patient if that is uh, not warranted. So as I mentioned, there are some systems that are physiologically present to eliminate these toxins. The immune system is part of it. If you are HLA deficient, this system is not working properly for you. So this means that when the organism is present, the antibodies uh, by the pathogen uh, recognizing receptors triggered by pentraxins are not going to be doing their job. So then this phagocytosis of this toxin in this example is not gonna cause the opsonization needed for its destruction. In other words, this system, when you're predisposed, like you are that 25% of the population, you will not have the system active. Fortunately, we have other systems in place that will help us, and these systems are the ones that we have to focus on in order to help our patients. The other clearance systems that I mentioned is the liver through the organic anion transport system, the kidney through the uh, glomerular filtration, and then the, trans, uh, the plasma transport through the lymphatic and drainage uh, system. In the liver, we know that uh, it can, the toxins can be excreted through the bile and to, uh, to the duodenum through the gallbladder. And during this process, we see that the, there is a, a mild uh, interaction with the bile and the mycotoxins, and the mycotoxins will bind to that bile, and then this bile will end up uh, going to the duodenum. In the duodenum, the bile will try to be reabsorbed through the enterohepatic circulation system. And if we at this point uh, um, do uh, an intervention, 
we can uh, eliminate these toxins without them going back to the gallbladder again because they do are, have some binding uh, possibility to the bile. And what I mean by this is that we can use uh, cholestyramine, cholecystipol, cholecevelam. These are uh, going to sequester uh, bile in the duodenum and ultimately removing these mycotoxins and these, um, and these stages. In the kidney, we know that they will be filtrated into the urine. We're going to see a lot of mycotoxins in the urine. That is why the test of the urine right now still remains the number one source of uh, these uh, toxins. We have seen that this inflammatory uh, response can cause uh, the conventional um, confusion with uh, other diagnoses such as chronic fatigue syndrome, uh, fibromyalgia, Lyme disease, including some other uh, neurodegenerative disorders. And we have also seen this associated to autism, PANS, PANDAS, and other uh, autoimmune encephalitic disorders. And we have also seen worsening of problems specific to Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, and then again to other central nervous system issues. And as, as that also happens, we, have a, we can see a Th1, Th2 disbalance producing elevated eosinophiles, elevated mast cells, and uh, overactivation of um, mastocytosis. The uh, elect uh, electromagnetic fields and food sensitivities and chemical sensitivities are sometimes very common with these cases. Yes, we can treat those sometimes with Keppra or with anti-seizure medications, but by treating the underlying cause, we will also help the patient eliminate these sensitivities. That's why when we see a patient that we're treating for Lyme, which is unresponsive to Lyme, which is testing negative for Lyme, which is CD57 and IgG antibodies are normal, then we should maybe think of something like this if the person has the history to support it. Shows us how the chronic inflammatory response syndrome will perpetuate a peripheral inflammatory response that if there is increased permeability in this blood-brain barrier, we will see the activation of microglia, which this initiates the cascade of the neuroimmunological system that activates astrocytes, which we know it, it is about 50% of the neuroimmunological force. And with this astrocyte activation and very vascular macrophages surrounding, we will see two major effects. First, the glutamate reuptake, which means that this amino acid neuroreceptor, neurotransmitter, excuse me, will be abundant because it's not being absorbed, and then elevated glutamate release. And with elevation of glutamate, which normally is needed for the chem uh, chemotaxis and neuroreceptors to function normally for these nerves, we're going to see excito excitotoxicity, which means the nerve is dying because of toxicity of glutamate. When this is happening, we also have a secondary problem, that is this oligodendrocyte is going to be uh, going through a mechanism called apoptosis, the natural destruction of cells. And with this oligodendrocyte disappearing, we will have demyelination. So we will have nerve damage and there will be no myelination of the other nerves that exist. This effect also uh, will perpetuate structural changes, structural brain injury. And this is, this is based on the fact that there is increased permeability of the blood-brain barrier. I want you to picture just two options. You have the option which is the good one and the option which is the not so good one. So if your body gets exposed to toxins, then you, and you don't have any HLA deficiency, then these toxins get removed from the body, so congratulations for you. But if these toxins enter the body, they get stored in the fat cells for long periods of time. Some patients who have a lot of adipose tissue have in some cases manifested more symptoms than the ones that don't. And then if they go to the capillaries, there will be problems with the blood flow, no endothelial, endothelial growth factor production, there will be uh, strokes, there will be biofilm formation. If they go to the immune system, there will be autoimmunity. There can be elevation of cardiolipins, uh, elevation of uh, myelin basic proteins as excreted that, will that can cause harm to certain areas, not only of the immune system, but of the neuroimmune system. And then they can activate cytokines and that's why they 
can activate chronic inflammatory response or CIRS. That is if they go to the fat cell and over there. But if they go after the fat cell into the effects of the leptin receptors, and then we have that because of the effects of the leptin receptors, we have reduced um, uh, melanocyte stimulating hormone, then we have all of these effects. We have reduction of the antidiuretic hormone, which regulates thirst. We have no sex drive, and uh, basically, uh, you know, who wants that? <laughs> there is change in cortisol, so there will be adrenal fatigue. There is a resistant staph bacteria because the immune system is not organized. The immune response is uh, atypical. And then there's prolonged illness because of the same reason. There is not an immune system that is organized. In addition, we have problems with absorption in the GI, and this can lead to leaky gut. We have chronic pain because there is no endorphin release. There is no happiness. And without happiness, there's pain. Then there is no melatonin. And because there's no melatonin, then patients don't sleep. Ultimately, if the patient progresses to a central nervous disease, then you might want to do a PCR of the cerebral spinal fluid. I get asked, well, what test do I use? I've been using for years the ELISA for, from real-time labs. There's also the mass spectrometry from Great Plains Laboratory and then organic acids from Genova. You cannot compare them because some are pattern-like, others are too specific, sometimes too specific, so ultimately you have to decide and determine which one you, you want to use. Treatment. Number one, remove the patient from the environment. Two, treat the fungus if necessary. Three, remediate. And sometimes if you can't remediate or if it's too expensive, then you know, maybe take the patient out of that. Be mindful about how much tox uh, detox you're doing. This can also make them constipated, so be careful if, it, if they're constipated then those mycotoxins are going to be reabsorbed. And these uh, mycotoxins may not be present if you're not giving the patient antifungals. If you're giving antifungals, these toxins may be more present. Um, in patients where there is involvement of their immune system in immune suppression, stop steroids, because steroids is one of the reasons why these toxins, these mold uh, um, organisms grow. grow. And uh, you can even give granulocyte colony stimulating factors to improve their granulocyte functions and neutrophils. The first line of therapy for central nervous system infections is I like to use boriconazole 99% of the time. And when that fails, I use cuspum fungi, and it's really good. Uh, uh, Amphotericin B, I try to stay away from it because of the kidney impl implications. Immunotherapy, important. Oh, uh, antifungals when needed. When you fail with the treatment of binders, you use antifungals. Peptides, of course, to immune regulate, like LL37, thymosin alpha-1. Stem cells, because they are immune modulator, and then if you have nerve damage, then they can help also with the construction. Also, although autologous stem cells are known to have more repairing functions for the nerves than allogenic. Uh, lipolysis, you know, if the patient doesn't have too much fats, then that can also help. And then also, uh, nasal ozone also in insufflations, phosphatidylcholine, and glutathione. Always support the neuroendocrine system. High dose vitamin D will help as well, as we have heard in the other conferences. Hyperbaric oxygen, dendritic cell therapy, this is something that immune modulates. And then plasmapheresis because it'll help clean the plasma from these mycotoxins. Uh, and then when, com when possible, confirm your diagnosis. Be aware of other disruptors. And if the patient is exposed to other issues like uh, gut problems, you may want to deal with them as well or uh, because at the end of the day, mold treatment is a long-term treatment. It's maybe 10, 10 months in some cases. It's not something quick, and that is all. Thank you very much. Uh -huh.